Well, let's see if we can do a live stream. <laughs> See if I remember how to do this. With any luck, we should be live. Cheers, everyone. Have a, a fantastic evening here, and hopefully you are too, wherever you may be tonight. It is Thursday night here in southwestern Ontario, and it is a beautiful night outside, and I should be outside enjoying it, but it's just been bugging me to get building something. It's been too many days, so... What I thought is it's high time that I put together the quadcopter that I've wanted to build for some time and I've been sort of setting up the the beginnings of it. So what we're going to do is this started off, this is going to be a budget quad build, there's not much to it. It's going to be for freestyle and it's with components that are not the newest, but we're going to update some things, make some things better, uh, use some uh, little fancier stuff here and there, but overall it will be, the heart of it is an older quad system. So this is the original quad frame. This is a six inch frame. We're going to scrap that. What I've got, if you follow me on Instagram or the other socials, you might have already seen this taking shape. This is the custom painted new quad that I've put together. And what I was going to do, so I was actually going to do a little competition or something to name it because you've seen the, the previous build was Red October here on the channel was a red color scheme 210 style quad. Carbon fiber, custom dipped. This time it's kind of blue and red and white and a little bit of the black coming through and there's gray as well. Um, I didn't like it. It turned out very clownish. The, the the red and the blue came out really overbearing. So what I did before I cleared it is I, I hosed it with a light coat of a, of a silver and it dulled it down a lot. And it, up close, it, it I don't much care for the look of it because the, the speckles kind of make it a little hazy, but in a way, it, I don't know, it's kind of neat in some ways too. So I don't know. We'll see. But what I'm, what I'm thinking is because of this blue color scheme, I'm thinking I'm going to name this uh, Blue Falcon in honor of JC. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, if, well, if you're a drone builder or into drones or flying things whatsoever, you would have seen by now you've run across the Project Blue Falcon YouTube channel. It was run by a really kind, kind soul named JC up until I guess over a year ago now and uh, he had a, an accident and was killed on his motorcycle but his videos li live on and I still use them as set up video so in honor of JC I think we will do the Blue Falcon build which will be a neat little quad. So that's the frame we're going to use. We'll ditch that other one. We'll use this one. We've got some dowel props. These did not come. This is a gear best kit from a year and a half ago. The props that came with it were absolute garbage. So I already kind of, I, I just threw them away. To be honest, they're completely junk. These dowel prop 5045 should work fine. I have some more aggressive ones too. We're going to use some Emacs motors. We're going to use these Emacs uh, red bottoms. These are old news in the quad world. They are definitely not state of the art, but they are a rock solid, durable, reliable motor. Uh, these are RS2205, uh, 2600 KV if I remember right. It's been a long time. Are they 2300? 2300 kV. So rock solid motor that'll just do the job for what we want with our quads. And I have them. They're old stock, but still brand new. And I have spares. So these are the genuine article. And nowadays you can pick these up fairly cheap too. So somebody else could recreate this as a budget build. Yeah, yeah kind of neat. And just check the feed here. Yeah, we are feeding. Good, good. It's been forever since I did a live stream, guys. Way too long. Okie dokie. Next up, flight control board. This is what came with it. This is the SP Racing F3, a very, very capable flight control board. Uh, I won't even bother pulling it out. There's, It's just a circuit board. It has the gyro, has all the brains on board. Works absolutely fine. Problem with these is... Uh, well, it's older now, and it is the F3 gen, and we're on to F4 and beyond now. But it's also missing on-screen display, so we're gonna we're gonna ditch this in favor of. I just got this in from Rotor Riot. 
Actually, no, I didn't get this from Rotorat. I had to order it on eBay because Rotorat didn't have them in stock anymore. I think they gave them out in their quad boxes. This is the DYS F4 Pro version 2, and this flight control is very unique. Well, not anymore. It used to be, it was unique. This is an F4 flight control with power distribution board and flight control built into one. It also has current monitoring, so we can see our amperage. It also has on-screen display, so it handles the entire Betaflight OSD right in the board, which is going to work bloody beautiful. This is what I already have on the Red October. Now, I retrofitted this, I think I did it live here on the channel. You guys might have joined. Uh, I'm super happy with it. It's a fantastic flight control. Uh, I love the DYS F4. It, it just works. And uh, we'll, give it a, we'll, give, uh, we'll give it a go. Uh, I know the results are going to be good here. So I like to stick with what, what I know works. And I know it will work with the upcoming pieces that we're going to assemble here. We're going to retrofit some other stuff too. Speed controls. We are going to use the factory speed controls. Now, again, these are not the best. These are by far not the best anymore. These are little b 30 amp speed controls. Totally capable speed control. This quad will draw nearly 100 amps at wide open throttle, and these are quite capable of handling it. And they are a very reliable, good little speed control. They are uh, not uh, D-Shot compatible. I think you can, I think you can do a little bit of a hack and do a firmware update on them. But I just run one shot 125 on them. No issues. It works fine. You just have to calibrate your throttle positions, and it, it just works. And well, I have them and they are reliable. They do introduce some noise into the quad sometimes. Uh, they're not the kindest on video feed systems, but on Red October, I just put a the standard capacitor across the power, and on the DYS F4, we have good filtered power that we can use for our video systems, so uh, we shouldn't have a problem. So we'll use these little B 30 amps. Next, I think. Electronics Workshop is here. Cheers. Well, absolutely, buddy. Well, these I highly advise doing a build somewhat similar to this. They work pretty good. So this is the camera that comes with this quad. Uh, it is a... What even is this thing? So I'll be honest. Cameras like these that came with these cheap quad kits about a year ago you have to take whatever they say with a grain of salt it i believe this one was marketed as the 800 tv line version and i'm not even seeing whether it is ccd or cmos doesn't matter we're gonna ditch it uh I don't much care for this style of camera. What we're going to do is, if you saw on previous videos on the channel, I recently got some AKK video equipment in. Again, in the mind of budget building. I like budget stuff. You guys know me. This is the AKK CA20. This is, um, well, I'll just say it, it's a direct clone of like a Swift. It's, it's a great little camera. What we'll do is we'll take this lens out of here, we'll ditch it, we'll swatch, switch that out with a GoPro Hero 2 lens that costs about $2.50 on eBay. I have several of them, some more just came in the other day. We will focus it and we will have a fantastic FPV video experience. It works beautiful. The color rendering is amazing with the wide angle lens that we'll put on here, which is way, way wider than this. We'll have a basically 180 degree field of view nearly, and it'll work great. So that's what we'll swap in for that. Next up, it did come with a video transmitter. Now, truthfully, I have nothing, I have nothing bad to say about these video transmitters. I've used this exact uh, TS582, 5828L, actually, I don't think I've used that one, but they're, they're all basically the same. Uh, the smaller ones, I might have been less milliwatts, but exact clone of this. 600 milliwatt video transmitter, this will work beautifully for on your quad, no question. These work uh, absolutely stupendous. I've had no issues, but um, you have to mess around with the button to change channels and stuff. And we've advanced into newer things. So what we'll do is we're gonna ditch that antenna and ditch this video transmitter. And what we're gonna use 
is the AKK FX3. This is the one you saw on a previous stream as well. This is a same looking video transmitter as that, except it will allow us to use smart audio. And if you're not familiar, smart audio allows us to control our video transmitter from our radio from our transmitter through beta flight through the flight control it allows us to change channels and stuff and this is the unit i've got here which is actually not at all what i expected oops you know what i'm going to switch this out again i'm going to pull a sneaky i'm not going to use this one this is the square form factor that would go on a micro quad that would just mount right above the the flight control I'm going to switch this out for one that you haven't seen yet. Instead of this FX3, I'm going to use the same as what you just saw, except it, the form factor will be the same as the one you saw, except it will be uh, 1200 milliwatts. And you'll see that on a mail bag as soon as it's on the mail shelf behind me. <laughs> I haven't even got it out yet. It just came in from AKK. So 1.2 watt. So we won't actually use this one after all. Maybe I should do a giveaway on the channel for that. So honestly, I don't think I'm, I'm not building any micros lately. So maybe, maybe we'll do something with that FX3. Great, great VTX, same guts as the ones I've used lots of times. So maybe, yeah, you guys let me know. Should we do a giveaway on that? Maybe. So that is the guts of what we're going to build. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be, I'm gonna be pretty happy with it, I think. Blue Falcon will be a great quad, and it's the same running gear I already have on Red October. I already have on two other quads that are the same build, same running gear. And the only one that I have problems with is my very first 210, where I rolled it on the asphalt in front of the house, and uh, I dinged up the bells on two of these, and it was a, it was a hard crash. And it didn't hurt the bells, but it did uh, hurt the bearings, and they're a little rough. But it still flies fine, actually, and Betaflight copes with the rough bearings just fine. It, it just irritates me that I can feel it. I know they're defective, but uh, that's the only time I've harmed one of these these Emax red bottoms. They're old news, and definitely not the most powerful thing out there, but totally capable. So yeah, that's gonna be fun. Uh, catch up real quick. Richard is here. Cheers, Richard. Ron is here. Cheers, Ron. Chris is here. Cheers, Chris. Good to see you. All right. Well, so that's the entire guts. That is the whole running gear. And because I'm familiar with this system and these parts, it doesn't take long to assemble at all. And if you're thinking about building a quad, like Electronics Workshop mentioned earlier, just dive in just do it uh it's it's not as hard as one might think it's a little tiny bit daunting at first until you sort of get the the lay of the land so to speak the firmware is so much easier now we're going to flash that dys f4 pro with beta flight and trust me out of the box it just works nowadays there's almost nothing you have to do anymore it, it, it just functions so what we're going to have to do is we're going to leave these wires on these speed controls. So the speed controls are going to go on the arms, something like so. And we have the well, let's grab motor out. Grab the motor. So we've got motor leads on the which is pretty standard on all motors now, some longer than others because now we're going to four in one ESCs. I like these because that's what I have. What we're going to have to do is pull these wires off the speed controls and get rid of this uh, reduction hazard materials, uh, lead-free solder on there, and we'll do our own. So the speed control is going to sit approximately yay on the arms. The motor is going to sit there. So we're going to cut the wires off on the motor and solder them onto the ESP pads. On the other end, going to our flight control and our power distribution, which is one board, we don't need to do anything. This is our power and ground going to feed our over 30 amps to this motor. And then this is our signal and ground wire, which goes on there. And we will just snip them off once we know how our flight control is going to be. Kind of like, sure. And yeah, nothing to it. What I've done in the past 
is I've gone ahead and decased these speed controls completely and done my own heat shrink on them. And then what I do is I heat shrink it once it's done here, and then I heat shrink it to the arm. What I'm thinking this time is we might shortcut it slightly and just trim the heat shrink off of here and then I will just heat shrink it to the arm, as I did before. Because they, they don't need to be sealed. What we'll do is we'll hit it with... What will we hit it with? I'll show you guys something. Where is my super stuff? Ah, yes. This stuff is unfortunately exceedingly expensive. This is MG Chemicals. Silicone modified conformal coating is a beautiful stuff. It's like the consistency of nail polish and it's uh, UV reactive so you can see where you've coated and it dries up and it seals all the water and nasties out. And the bottle is half empty because I spilled it and I just about cried because it is exceedingly expensive. I also have it an aerosol, which I've never used yet, which I have enough to last me till doomsday on that same stuff. Also extremely expensive, but hopefully you only buy it once unless you're like me and spill it. What is the cost of the whole thing? Ron, the whole thing here, honestly, uh, buying the components, like, well, you wouldn't even, if you bought these components, you can probably buy them on clearance. Uh, I couldn't even say at that, but honestly, you could you could put this together in the I want to say two hundred ish dollar range. I think is totally reasonable. This kit before the upgrades was was uh, I was buying them on clearance on Banggood or not Banggood Gearbest for a hundred and seventy nine dollars for the kit uh without those upgraded parts with these escs with this frame with these motors i haven't seen that deal in a while the other option is you can just buy a ready to fly quad uh, if you go back on my channel the uh, x215 pro uh, is last week a friend wanted to a uh, friend paul came over to check out these quads and he was interested in getting into them and i looked at the price of that x215 pro on gear best and it was 179 dollars canadian shipped uh and it was it was a flash sale and it was i think half off or so uh you can't even build the quad for that it, it's canadian pesos that was a heck of a deal so if you're willing to shop around you can definitely do it under 200 uh you can also do a complete ready to fly under 200 dollars sometimes so. anton subscribed cheers so this one, in this case, under 200, except for the upgraded parts, and I don't have a price on those. The the flight control, I think, was, I think I paid $32 Canadian for it from eBay a few weeks ago, and the, the VTXs were actually review units, but yeah, so that's where we'll sit. It's going to be one heck of a good little build. Um, if you put it under a bulb, and, or if you put it under a bulb and light, it cures in the. No, it doesn't work that way. The UV doesn't cure it in the bottle. This is it's it's only UV reactive just to uh, change color. It's uh, exposure to oxygen that cures this stuff. It's uh, the UV just changes it. It, it glows a, a iridescent blue, and then that way you can tell where you've coated because it's completely clear to the naked eye. You need the UV to to show you where you've coated, which is a, this stuff is again. There's a reason it's it's expensive. It's the real thing. It's it's for industrial uses. So yeah. It won't care up in the bottle though, thankfully, or we'd I'd be semi upset. So what we'll do is we'll carefully we're gonna carefully have to get a new exacto knife. Actually, we're gonna carefully warm up our soldering irons first. And then I think we'll investigate here whether we want to just decap the top of this heat shrink. Oh, that is absolutely so dull, it's not even funny. Surely I gotta have a... It's been a long time since I changed this blade. I have some... These things are ancient. But they should still hold an edge. They gotta be better than this thing. That's ah, functionally useless. We'll go ahead and see whether we... See what we want to do. I know pulling them off completely and resealing them is definitely the right way to go. 
then you then you know what you got but they have such a nice like it's really good heat shrink on here not that mine isn't i have some bought mine from digikey it was expensive but it uh lasts you just about forever there i think that's the way we'll do it let's shortcut we'll pull these off and we will just solder the new ones on. I can always just put a piece of my heat shrink over the whole thing again, but I see no reason to pull these off completely. Yeah, let's do it this way. But we do need to get these wires off and get that lead-free solder out of there, replace it with a nice little bead of our own and then we will can solder our motor terminals on once we assemble. What I'll do is I'm gonna learn the I learned the hard way on the last two assemblies I liked to I don't know why I'm I, I mounted the motors on and when I'm mounting the motors you have to you should Loctite the hardware into the bottom so I went ahead and did that well then when the time came to put the speed controls on the arms I'm like well it would be really nice to be able to heat shrink that on the arm while the motor sticks up quite far. And I didn't want to take it back out because I had already Loctited it on. So what I did is I stretched the heat shrink with a pair of pliers. And lo and behold, it shrinks right back down as far as it would have initially, which surprised me. And it worked fine. This time what we'll do is we'll get the wires all right. We'll solder them, but we're not going to have the motors firmly mounted yet. And then what we can do is we can turn the motor at least sideways and slip the, slip the heat shrink over it and lock it down. And it'll be fantastic. You can also just, uh, most of the quad guys, if you watch Rotor Riot or any of the other freestyle guys, all they do is they just electrical tape them down. And and that's there's nothing wrong with that. But I love the look of clean heat shrink and a nice clean build so much more. I like taking just a little bit of pride in the build, but <sighs> I'm starting to understand why they do that. Because if you do have damage, if you do have... If you dunk it, if it goes in the swamp or the water, it is so much less annoying if you're just cutting off some electrical tape and replacing it than if you're cutting off your nice heat shrink that you did such a nice job assembling on there and made it all look all pretty. <laughs> so maybe there's something to be said for just a rough stick them down and be done with it. I don't know. Again, that's the beauty of building your own quad. You can do the build however you like, as detailed as you like. And, well, there's nobody to answer to but yourself. There. Beautiful. Ready to come off of there. We can get these off. Usually sharpen exacto, exacto so sandpaper. Yeah, I'm not that ambitious for the price of an exacto blade. No thanks, I am not sharpening one. <laughs> uh, are you gonna heat heat shrink from the other side, the controller side? Uh, no. Uh, no. This is this is the frame, and coming from this side, I would yeah no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can't get heat shrink on that way. If it was a multi piece frame. Absolutely. If the arms were bolt on, these are not on this 210. It is a one piece frame. It has to go on from the outside. Again, there's something to be said for using just some electrical tape. In the top right corner right now, you can see the Red October build actually. I forgot. I have that B roll kind of cycling through. All right. What shall we do? Let's go ahead. It's set up here and we'll go ahead and get some solder off of there not the most enthralling build part but it is a necessary evil I think yeah let's just do something like that so we'll go ahead crap I'm out of my good solder that's not good 
usually for big jobs when I'm tinning the tip, I just use this. This is Nextech standard rosin core 6040. Uh, this is 1.6 millimeter, big thick stuff. It's great for tinning the tips for big jobs like this, but unfortunately I'm out of that. And Nextech was the stuff I used to buy at Radio Shack or AKA the source here in Canada and it's well, it is no longer with us. So I will tin this up. And you just want to put a little bit of solder on your tip, just enough to melt this lead-free garbage, heat the joint, and it should just fall off of there. And come on, stay there. That's not gonna work. Usually just want something to pull against. There we go. See how that doesn't heat worth a darn? It's because we don't have enough rosin core on the tip for the heat transfer. And we get some solder on there, and boom, it'll just fall off. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we might as well pull that solder off of there right now. Because this is lead-free stuff, it just it's useless and garbage. You can see here, let me show you the difference. This is, where's my mouse? Let's go to this screen. On the microscope, you should be able to see, see how that's all opaque and chalky looking. These ones are a little shiny because that's the ones that I was applying rosin core solder to my tip when I tinned it. This one was, I just pulled it off. That, the lead free, that pretty much as good as you'll get with using it whatsoever. It will always have that chalky appearance and will always be uh, less flexible and more prone to issues. This is why uh, space related items do not actually use lead free. Anything with vibration, heavy vibration and stuff, it's, it's nasty to crack. That's why a lot of uh, moving components will have um, things in vehicles and stuff when I was a mechanic for many many moons most of the electronics failures in vehicles I actually repaired instrument clusters every day I'd repair instrument clusters for the different shops in town and the root cause of them was always cracked solder joints made it very easy to repair them especially if you'd done a bunch of them before it was always at the large pins uh, going in usually, or any pin header on the component. So I'm just using a solder sucker to pull this off. Nothing to it. Sometimes you got to apply a little bit. We don't need to get all off of there, but the more the better, because we're going to reapply it with our own good stuff. And that's for the most part, most of it there. Good enough. Again, this is one of the things you don't have to do if you buy a ready to fly quad, but that one's got a little bit left on it. I'm not too heartbroken. These two, absolutely fine and ready to go. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and let's retin that while we've got the iron out and running. This would be nicer if we had a lot larger gauge of solder because it needs a fair bit. You need a high heat iron for this. These pads on the board are large. These are high current. These are going to be flowing 30 amps approximately at wide open throttle so it takes a little bit of heat when you're done what you should have is solder joints that look like this well they're not joints yet they're just pads but they're ready to accept the wire so when we go to put our tinned motor leads on there see how nice and shiny those are they come up in kind of a, a dull hill shaped not sharp like a volcano or anything so you know it was good and hot it flowed to the entire uh, pad you can see the solder mass did its job and it good and hot good joint or well will allow us to have a very good joint yeah and that's my solder tips for that um Oh yeah, yeah, put the heat shrink on the wires and control, yeah, but the problem, yeah, so that doesn't work either in this case. So what was suggested is to put the heat shrink on the wires and slide it down this way. You could, but then again, 
how do you get it around we're talking heat shrink around the arm so no matter what it's got to come from this side it can't go that way you could just heat shrink the esc that way absolutely but what i'm doing is i'm heat shrinking it directly to the arm all the way around the arm here and it is permanently attached so again that's no ricky sorry uh, double-sided 3m could be strong enough uh nope so do not rely on double-sided 3m tape uh, you will see me use that absolutely uh, where's my tape here's my tape when we get to that stage of the build here's my double-sided tape when i have this heat shrinked uh, the wires and ready to be stuck down on the arm and heat shrinked to the arm i do put double-sided tape in between to hold it down you could use double-sided tape and just stick this down and it will be fine for a debatable amount of time and then the day will come where it will separate from the arm and it will lift from the arm particularly when you're in dives and crazy things and i'll show you Here. your esc will be on the arm there plus yeah, whatever let's say quarter to three eighths of an inch and down here right at the top of this bell is a swirling blade of tri-blade death so when this lifts up ever so slightly and that prop is flexing down when you're under uh, whatever forces it will chop this to bits and destroy it and what actually can happen even when it's stuck down is you can have prop strikes especially when you hit something and a blade doing a ridiculous amount of rpm goes right through the top of the esc and that's actually a, a common cause of failure so a lot of people will put a piece of prop on the top here or uh, guards but whatever you do you need this stuck down uh, not just relying on double-sided tape because if it comes up and gets into the blades of death then it's uh, well it's no more fly that day and no bueno then you get to go home and change an esc or change one on the spot if you're if you have the stuff tomorrow you're gonna see a little video i did on it annoyed me the other day i couldn't do a field repair with a soldering iron because i didn't see i didn't have all the things i needed with me and tomorrow the little different format of video coming on the channel i hope you guys enjoy them i'm trying to make uh, the format a little bit more entertaining so tomorrow is uh, another format kind of like last week but uh in my opinion much better whereby i do kind of a vlog format oh come on again not enough solder for heat transfer i'm grabbing on the right wire right that's a stubborn one there we go so uh part of that video coming tomorrow is uh, i did a quick little power supply system okay this is annoying i need something heavier or better or let's just use this like it was supposed to be used How about, let's do that let's do that which actually i think that alligator clip's just gonna fall out of there <laughs> anyway you'll see a little nifty little buck converter system that i put together tomorrow for doing uh field repairs with my little usb powered soldering iron and hopefully you guys like it let me know what you guys think of the video format i'm quite proud of it i think i think you'll like tomorrow's video a lot more than previous than last week's i hope Thank you to all my Patreon supporters that make such things possible. I'm trying to make better videos. Uh, zip ties, yep. You can use zip ties to hold your ESCs down. Absolutely, nothing wrong with that. Do you use the TS-100 in the field? No, I do not. I have a, a Cheever knockoff kind of thing you can definitely use the ts100 i do not have one um i thought about getting one but honestly i have a uh, you have to go back a bunch of mail bags and i think i did a, i did a live stream oh, i want to say it was maybe last fall where we tested this cheap cheap usb powered thing and truthfully i thought it would never work now it's not going to work for jobs like this it's not going to work like like it will you can get this done but it's not going to work as fast as this but truthfully it does it worked i was blown away so yeah it just runs on five volt usb 
And it has a it has a three and a half millimeter headphone jack on it, so you can find it the exact model just by looking for that on eBay. Again, it was like five bucks. So, uh, yeah, it's good enough for going to the field. But unfortunately, the other day I didn't bring a USB power supply with me. So now I have one that'll run on any of my lipos. There we go. Those are soldered up. All the nasty lead-free garbage is removed. One more, ready to go. You just keep rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Um, yeah, not much to it. So you will see, like I mentioned, the. I'm not gonna. I still might do the mailbag videos, kind of the same, the same sort of format. But I don't know. I'm gonna try to just bring a little bit more entertainment factor to the videos and do I don't know it, it's so hard to always do tutorials and build videos they take forever any of you out there youtubers will know it is very very large amount of production work to do a good quality tutorial video why is that being ridiculous so, right. And what I'm thinking, the vlog format I can do is not only, in my opinion, more entertaining, more watchable, it's also much easier to produce in some ways. In some ways it's harder, but in some ways it's much, much easier. So I'm thinking it might be, it might be good. We're going to try it for a while and see how it works. Last week's video did not go over very well, a lot of people. We're not too happy about that, but then again, anytime you change anything of a format on YouTube, people don't like change. But the content is essentially the same, it's just a different way of presenting it. In my opinion, more fun and entertaining way. But we'll see. Alright, those are cleaned up. Gone. Gone is all that healthy lead-free stuff. On with the lead. Oh yeah, and I don't have my fume extractor going. Do, do as I say and not as I do. Should have a fume extractor running. My father was uh, electronics repair for all his life, essentially, from his early teenage years. And I think in his 30s, he came down with Bell's palsy, and the best guess is that uh, is what uh, it was the lead and rosin fumes for many years that probably set it off but nobody knows what actually triggers Bell's palsy so nobody could say for sure thankfully he got better but use a fume extractor these, these fumes are not good for anyone come on come on Oh, and the other thing with the, the lead-free solder, it does not transfer heat with beans. That's, again, why it's so important to have some leaded solder on the tip to aid in the heat transfer. It is just, well, it's good for the environment, so that's good. We like good for the environment, and in a manufacturing setting, they can work with it no problem. But for home electronics and such, ugh, this stuff is horrible. It is no bueno. This is our last one, and we are going to be all set to go mounting some electronics. There we go. You can also use solder wick to pull that solder off of there if you wanted, but it's a lot of solder. It's a pretty significant pad, so I find the solder sucker to work pretty good. You can find the ones I'm using on my recommended equipment page in the description below if you're interested, but you can also just go to Amazon and search for such things too. Pretty universal. This is a really junk one. It's actually a real piece of junk. This one is about as cheap as they come, but it actually is working fine. I'm quite happy about that. There doesn't look much gap between the three connections. Nope, there is a minimal amount of gap between these connections. It is quite small. There it is under the microscope very very little so on that board is a solder mask and that is the coating between the pads that 
keep solder from sticking. And it does a really good job of more or less repulsing the solder and keep the solder on the pads. And then the, uh, the rosin, you can see in between them, aids that as well. But yeah, there's like we're talking a millimeter between them. Very, very small. Uh, you have to keep an eye on it if you're if you're not real good at soldering. Don't worry about it. Just follow exactly along as how I did here and remove the solder and apply fresh and it will naturally look after itself if you're doing it hot. If you're doing it cold where it's opaque looking and wants to kind of follow your iron all over the place, then you can bridge them very easy. But if it's hot, 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 if your iron is good and hot and strong, you'll never have a problem and you won't bridge pads. It's very rarely unless you put in way, way too much solder. And, and then it's easy to fix. If you bridge your pads, here, well, we can bridge one. We can bridge one. This is a good little learning experience, I suppose. Let's deliberately see if we can bridge one. See, it, it's actually extremely hard. There we go. Go back under the microscope. There we go. That is what would end up being the end of our speed control. And what you can do is you can do like what I did with the solder sucker, or you can also use wick, which is uh, just is that going to show under the microscope? Yeah, not really. I'll show you what it is. You can just use this braided stuff and we can put that on there. Now, I would not advise using wick for this particular instance, but what the heck, we can we can do such a thing. It's not a problem. And you just take your iron, take your wick, Lay it across. I can't tell whether this is on camera, so I'm going to assume it is. And we're going to heat up that solder, and we're going to get our wick in there. And hopefully, with any luck, it's going to pull the solder up and leave us with no problemo. Just like that. And we are no longer bridged. Uh, don't mess around too long on the board, or we will destroy it. That was long enough that uh, I was... If it wouldn't have come in like one second more, I would have been stopping to let it cool off. But there we go. No more bridge. Easy fix. And I like to try and show such things to, so hopefully people don't uh, get intimidated by building stuff like this. Like, this is crazy. This is a 30 amp speed control that's going to be flowing 30 amps plus at times. And that's a lot of power. All right, I got to go here. I don't know what the wife's screaming about, so something bad happened. Talk to you in a bit.